It's my pleasure to introduce our panelists for uh, for publishing. We've got the legendary John Hartness right here. Legend of my own mind. Yeah, <laughs> one, <laughs> um, John's pretty prolific. Let's just say that, and he, he, he is Charlotte famous and probably a little more famous uh, uh, outside of Charlotte. Uh, we have Betsy Thorpe with Betsy Thorpe Literary Services. Thank you for being here. Really appreciate it. Uh, we've got Emily Gooding from Biblioboard. We're really happy to have Biblioboard here. And Emily, I hope you'll share some of the new features that the library has now through Biblioboard. So, and we have Mindy Coon from Warren Publishing. Thank you guys so much for being here. Really it. <laughs> so, my first question is the same as the last panel Who are you? Where are you from? And tell us what you do. Go ahead. So, I'm John Hartness. I write science fiction fantasy. Southern Gothic, paranormal mystery, comedic horror, and anything else that someone will write me a check for. Um, I'm from the wilds of Western York County, South Carolina. I now live here in Charlotte, and I'm the founder and publisher of Falstaff Books. We publish science fiction, fantasy, horror, and anything else that will sell enough copies. We are a full service traditional publisher. We're a small press based right here in Charlotte, and when I'm done, you can come by all of that. <laughs> Hi, everybody. I'm Betsy Thorpe. Um, I was um, raised in Connecticut, out just outside New York, and I um, worked the first 10 years of my career in New York book publishing at the big publishers like uh, Simon & Schuster and Random House and HarperCollins. And then when I had my first child, I went freelance, and so that was 18 years ago, and I opened up Betsy Thorpe Literary Services. And I've been um, working with indie authors ever since, helping them decide whether to go traditional or self-publishing, um, and mostly editing, sometimes ghostwriting, and that's what I do. Um, my name's Emily Gooding. I'm with Biblia Moore Library, so I might have a slightly different perspective than the rest of the panel up here. Um, we work with libraries and indie authors to provide services um, at no cost the author to be able to produce professional quality print ready and ebooks and also get them distributed at library systems all across the US and Canada. Um, we're here today because Charlotte Mecklenburg Library is offering all of these services to the whole community now. Um, so we're really excited to do that. We're based down in Charleston, South Carolina. And I'll, I'll put on my library hat for a minute. Um, we're, the library is really making some moves to really start supporting and curating local authors and local creators, and we're really excited about that. So now I'll take my library hat off. So um, we'll, we'll learn more about Biblia Board today. So um, go ahead, Mindy. Sure. Um, I'm Mindy Kuhn. I am the owner of Warren Publishing. I have owned the company for a little over two years now. Um, we've been in business 30 years, located here in Charlotte. We have an office um, off of Ardrichel in Valentine. Um, I, long story short, I started um, my background is journalism, graphic design, um, so I kind of have that background. I worked at you know, publishing in the design kind of end way back in the day. Um, I was a, I was a columnist too um, from the very beginning of my career, so I kind of have that writing design background. Um, I guess I've owned the company two years. We have Warren Publishing, which is a hybrid, um, which again is something, we've been in business and used that business model for 30 years now, um, but it's a partner in the process, and we can you know, talk about that later, I'm sure. But um, And then we also have uh, Pipevine Press, which is a traditional um, model. So we produce a couple books a year through that, um, through that model. Um, so the last decade has really been huge as far as changing what publishing looks like, changing even what reading looks like. Can you guys talk about how your business is fitting into those changes and what and, and how are you positioned to, to either one embrace that change or leverage that change? I'll start. I've been in the business for um, 25, 26 years now. And back in the day in 19 when I first started, it used to be that it was traditional publishing or nothing, or what we called Vanity Press. Um, so Vanity Press was, unfortunately, you have to buy 10,000 copies of your own book. Um, and most people died with those copies in their basements. And so it was very sad. 
So and then the world kind of changed in the late 90s with the um, innovation of lightning source, um, not lightning source, lightning press, which is print on demand technology. So you could upload a PDF of your cover and your interior and then your book is printed. And it's no longer out of print, it will always be in print. So there used to be something like, in traditional publishing, we used to have something like a threshold of you had to sell at least 500 copies a year of your book or else it would go out of print. Well, that's no longer the case now. You no longer have to meet that threshold because they can just, there's no longer warehousing fees for storing all those hundreds of books. So anytime anybody orders a book, it's literally printed, spit out, and the shipment is fulfilled. So it's been a huge game changer for authors because you're no longer relying on traditional publishers to get your book out. I encourage people who do have a marketable book to at least try with traditional publishing because there is an avenue into a lot more stores and libraries than you would get otherwise, but I'll be interested in hearing about your services. But um, if you do not get picked up, this is a huge um, ability for you to get your book out there that you wouldn't have had in the past. So the world is flat in that regard now. Um, and I think it's it's huge, and anybody anywhere in the world can order your book. Aren't you glad you're here in 2018? <laughs> <laughs> Man, well, so uh, we exist because of the changes in yeah. publishing. I believe that we are living in a renaissance of small press because of the changes in technology. Because my books, I only brought paperbacks today, but we can produce paperbacks and hardcovers of the same quality that New York does because aside from the first runs, a lot of the reprints are using print-on-demand technology too. So that really does level the playing field for small presses and with the pretty significant reduction in editorial staff at many of the New York presses, those people are now freelancing and small presses are hiring them or they're going on to create small presses. But the thing that has really caused a surge in small press and the quality of small press is, and here's my, controversial, my first controversial statement, you don't care about print. From an indie author standpoint, your money isn't in print. Less than 15% of my annual revenue is in print. Digital and audio, makes my living. Print makes enough to cover my convention attendances. Now I do 40 cons a year, so that's not an insignificant amount of money, but audio is the fastest growing segment of the book buying population. At last documented numbers, it was 14% of the book sales and increasing every year. So if you're not doing audio, you're leaving money on the table and anyone can do audio the same way that you can do ebook and print books. So you do still have to do your research and learn how to do it. Because just because you can doesn't mean you should. It's like me and spandex. <laughs> I can, I shouldn't. That's the second controversial statement. <laughs> I know, just because, just because you like the bears, baby. <laughs> So we exist, I as a published, I started off as a self-published author and in 2016 I expanded that to include publishing other people's work and created Falstaff Books as a real entity. And in the last three years we published uh, somewhere in the neighborhood of 40 titles and we have 120 or so under contract for the next five years. So I mean we're busy. But we exist because of those sea changes in the publishing industry. Mindy, tell us a little bit about how, how you guys have adapted to the changes and, and what, what, what you're doing now. Sure. Um, we, we, look, you were correct on, on um, a lot of levels. What I think is great, too, is the fact that um, just like movies and um, You've got a little bit of something for everybody. So people who want audiobooks, they're there. People who want ebooks, they're there. 
Um, and so the same thing goes in, in our company. What we've done is we've got a lot of offerings. If you do a children's book, we do um, hardcover, softcover. We, I personally don't and won't do um, ebook versions other like for a picture book for kids. I feel like you know, old school, you need to have that hardcover book and read with your child. So um, I come from that level when it comes to children's books, but otherwise, I think that the, there's plenty of opportunity for ebook. Um, what's interesting, statistics that I um, have just recently learned too, the last couple of years, print books are actually on the rise again. Um, last year was up 19%, um, and it's actually, last year was the first year that it, was, it had grown over ebook growth. So they're starting, the print books are actually starting to make a um, resurgent back into, um, you know, with readers because of a variety of reasons, but one being, you know, you want to have something in your hand if your batteries go out or if your lighting is bad. So, but yet some people will read all different opportunities. Like they'll read an e-version or they'll have an audio book for their travels or they'll maybe have a print book for by the pool. So. I think it just opens another avenue of, of possibilities and opportunities for the reader. So that's kind of what I'm noticing is that you know a lot of people are like, oh, print's dead or this is dead, and it's just not. It's just another angle. And there, um, years in the future, I'm sure we're gonna have other things that are gonna add to it as ways for people to read. But um, it's just another opportunity, and we've kind of embraced that with what we produce with our authors as well. I mean, you have to if you want to still be relevant after 30 years. And also it does depend on genre, like romance books are very popular in ebooks, probably fantasy books as well. Nonfiction I think is terrible in ebook form because there's a lot of footnotes, there's pictures, there's charts. They translate terribly into ebooks. So um, so really it depends. Learn your market, learn what's selling in the different genres and figure out whether an ebook investment is worth it. Yeah, I mean, anything I say is going to be from the standpoint of, I am a genre fiction publisher. If you write nonfiction or textbooks or poetry, ignore anything I have to say, <laughs> except this bit, you're not going to make money writing poetry. Um, unless you're Billy Collins, and if you are, you're awesome, because Billy Collins is awesome. They can sell portions of the rappers. Yeah. That, but that's still in book sales. <laughs> so yeah, I'm a, I'm a genre fiction writer, and a lot of that translates for memoirs as well, or biography. But yeah, with nonfiction, I don't know buck kiss about that. <laughs> um, so I'm going to shelve my Civil War ebook. Um, so that you, know, <laughs> you, you don't shelve an ebook. You don't shelve an ebook. <laughs> That's why ebooks are always in print because we don't care about shelf space. <laughs> Emily, tell us a little bit about what Biblio Board is offering and what, what they're doing in We're the market. Kind of uniquely positioned in this whole advent of well, in the advent of print on demand publishing. Um, Biblio Board was formerly Book Search, which was then sold to Amazon to have create space. So we were part of the of the market of print-on-demand books coming out, and then after selling and taking a few steps back, um, we realized that we then wanted to kind of take a different approach and actually facilitate libraries, small bookstores, indie bookstores, being able to identify and acquire the quality self-published indie books out of indie books out of um, kind of that wall of content that seems to have come out in recent years, um, especially with libraries. I don't think there's a library system in the country that has the bandwidth to go through all the self-published books that are coming out every year, even just locally within their own state or county, um, it can be really difficult. And of course, it's a public service. No librarian wants to say no. Members in their community with things like this. Um, so that's kind of where we started um, our new approach, um, then partnering with Library Journal in particular. Um, and for those of you who don't know, Library Journal is, because unless you're a librarian or a small press, you probably might not. Um, Library Journal was founded by the founder of the Dewey Decimal System, so it's been around for a minute. It's probably the, most, the foremost <laughs> publication for libraries and librarians. Um, they put together book lists, reviews, things of that nature, so they're really great at doing that vetting kind of for us. We provide the technology and they go ahead and look through all of the books that are coming in and are able to identify um, really promote specific books to their audiences since they know the library market so well. So it's kind of switching gears here. Um, you know, you guys see submissions come across your desk. Um, oh, God. 
What makes that manuscript that comes across your desk stand out to you? What are, what are you looking for? And it might be genre specific, but, but what, what are you, when you see something good, what, it, what, is, what is it that you're seeing? I can speak in regard to a couple different genres, um, one being children's books. Um, when you write a children's book, you want something engaging, you want to make sure you're, um, you're, that whole show not tell is so important, it's so cliche, but yet we turn down so many books because of the fact that they just, you know, Susie walked from here to here, or, you know, you, there's nothing that's engaging, there's no dialogue, there's no, um, rhyme, there's, it doesn't have to rhyme, but you need something that is um, a little more showy than just flat. And that's really kind of across the board on, um, you always look for good writing, and I have my, um, my VP editor-in-chief who does a lot of the reviewing and kind of um, searching on that, but, but we look for things that um, do not have typos. That, that, that's well constructed, that's, like I said, engaging, that shows that you know how to write. So many people, um, especially indie, um, it's fantastic that everyone can put out their message, but so many people just don't take the time to polish it up before they send it out for review. So whether you're, you're sending it to somebody smaller um, as a, a partner company like a hybrid or whether you're sending it to a literary agent to pitch, please, you know, vet it out ahead of time. Make sure that you're, you're whether you hire an editor and kind of at least like, oftentimes, I mean, that's always what you should have at the end anyway and, and that's part of what we do. But you want to make sure that it's it's looked through and there's no typos in the that you're watching story and your plot development and that you're not introducing characters, you know, on the last page of the book that haven't been through the whole thing. So take that time ahead of time and don't just think, oh, I'm just going to submit it here and it's going to, you know, ooh, all this will magically happen. I find a lot of people don't know what the parameters of publishing are, so. If you're publishing a YA book, it has to be between, say, 50 and 80,000 words. If you're publishing a fiction book, it has to be between 70 and 100,000 words. So a couple people have come to me lately looking for an edit, and their book, of the one I got today, was 187,000 words. So that's twice as long as it should be, and that's hugely expensive to edit. So I think a lot of people just sit down and write without the knowledge of what, what are the bands in which I have to write and then they just produce way too much and they go into way too much detail and it's excruciating to cut out all of the characters that you love and, and you've worked so hard on. So um, you know that's different in fantasy, but again, learn your genre and what's acceptable and what's not acceptable and, and for indie publishing too that's very important because you don't want to produce something that is this thick for a wide audience because a it costs a lot to produce so it might be costing 25 or 30 dollars for you to print i mean not to print but to sell and um and also who has time to read all that so, you know, well, now you know, I'm going to shelve my main project. <laughs> and, uh, um, Remember, baby, ebooks. That's right, <laughs> ebooks. Absolutely. Right. Um, your manuscript has to go through three levels of slush readers before I see it, and I only take about one in five. Uh, my slush team is instructed that I only want to see the top two percent of submissions. Since June, they have sent me two books we get about 120 submissions a month. The probably 40% are rejected exactly because of the things that she just said. It says on our website that we want things, 60 to 110,000 words usually hit our sweet spot. That means that the 170,000 word epic fantasy I received this week had better be amazing and it wasn't <laughs> um, copula spiders how many of you guys know what copulas are he was walking she was sitting Re if you remove as many for genre fiction if you remove as many iterations of the verb to be as possible it will increase the 
at the immediacy of your prose, and it is much more likely that we will get through the first three chapters that we request with your submission, and you might get asked for a full. I counted 10 instances of the verb to be in the first two paragraphs of a submission we received this week. I was bored, I was looking through slush, it happens. Um, I sent it on to our tier one readers and said, yeah, you're not going to pass this on, but I'm not reading past the first half page. You can tell me if it gets amazing later. So every publisher has submission guidelines on their website, read them. You wanna stand out, be hook me, genre fiction publisher. Kill somebody, <laughs> blow something up, have a werewolf come into the room, put a ghost on the first page. <laughs> uh, look at the stuff I'm publishing. <laughs> Seriously, there's a dragon on the cover. Do you think it's about fl fluffy bunnies? <laughs> so know who you're submitting to. I get a lot of submissions that look like they're just random Hey, I, I went on duotrope.com and found 40 publishers. I'm going to send them the exact same, dear sir or madam. Dear sir, dear sir for a woman. Coming. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and in genre, I get a lot of dear madam. Yeah. And I'm like, I know a lot of women, and they're not named John. <laughs> right. So do your homework, because you're asking us to invest our money in your book. Because I'm looking at covering the cost of editorial, the cost of layout, the cost of cover, the cost of promotion, and a year or more of my life shepherding your book into existence. Do me the courtesy of doing your job before you send it in. By the way, I'm not the nice one. <laughs> I'm always Simon on the panel. <laughs> I'm not as nice as Simon most days. Yeah. Uh, so what may, well, you guys have kind of answered that. I'm not going to answer that. Let's see. Oh, come on. Give me a chance no, to block uh, you've, already, you've already done it. I was like, what makes a book dead on arrival? But you guys pretty much beat that for Missing the genre. <laughs> I mean, I get historical, I get historical fiction. I don't do is people throw things at the wall and see if they stick. Yeah. So, and a lot of people will submit to agents who do not publish it in that area. And so you have to do, you have to approach book publishing as though it's your job because it is this is an, an investment that you're making in a product. Yeah. So, a book is a product, it's a passion, you know, it's love. You're putting all of your heart and creative soul into it, but in the end, it's a product. And so just as you would launch a KitchenAid blender and do your research about who's going to sell a KitchenAid blender and who can manufacture it, the same thing should be said for a book. So if you're approaching agents or publishers, do your research, make those letters personal to each person that you're writing to. I'm writing to Warren Publishing because you, know, you do X, Y, and Z, and I really think that's great writing to Falstaff because I think your fantasy lineup is incredible. So I'm writing to you Agent X because you represented you know, Teresa so Ann Fowler and she's tremendous and I'm a huge fan and so therefore I thought you might like my 80,000 word novel and learn how to write those query letters. There's tons of online resources. Query Shark is yes. so good. There's so many good resources out there so if you don't do your research first and just say, hey, uh, I reached the end, I wrote the end, and you haven't put any of the work into it doing second, third, fourth drafts, um, getting beta readers, getting a professional editor to look at it and assess it and see what its weaknesses and strengths are and mark it with a writer's group. Going into a writer's group yeah, and absolutely. having monthly meetings. Those are extremely important. So again, treat this, it, it's going to be everybody's second job here, likely, unless you're retired. But treat this as though it's your second job and, and pay a lot of attention to it. Yeah, it, writing should be fun. It should be something that you enjoy doing. But it ain't just a hobby 
for those of us who are receiving your manuscript, <laughs> this is how I feed my family. A book that flops is, means I'm eating ramen for that month. <laughs> I'm in genre publishing, I eat a lot of ramen anyway. <laughs> You know, something for, for me, as we got our book out, there are a lot of people or entities who are like promising the world or sending you a tw Twitter direct message and saying, hey, <laughs> like the book. I got one this morning. Yeah. Uh, can you guys talk to the audience, or can you guys talk to us a little bit about pitfalls to avoid, scams, that kind of thing? I mean, it just seems like I've seen less of it, but I definitely remember it being prolific as I got started. Well, there's a, there's a lot of um, hybrid publishers out there that are using the same technologies as anybody else can. So everybody can go to Ingram Spark, everybody can go to Amazon, print on demand, upload your book. And these people assist you going through that. So you have to make sure that you're reputable and you have to make sure that the cost you're paying for them to facilitate your way through are not excessive. So some people will claim that there are you know, you hit submission, and within 24 hours, you're receiving, yes, we want you. Well, how can anybody possibly read anything in, in within an hour and a half, you know, of your 80,000 word book? So, um, you know, express caution. Some people want, you know, I want you to buy 5,000 copies of your own book in order for me to print you. I want you to spend $10,000 on marketing in order for me to print you. So just do your research, make sure that is not expected or necessary. You should be paying for an editor, you should be paying for a designer, you should be paying for a copy editor, but what, you know, but what are those costs? That, and who are these people that you're hiring? That depends. If you're going with a straight traditional publisher, you should not be paying for anything. Right. This is hybrid. Yeah. Um, yeah. Those, well, are, those are the areas that you're most likely to be scammed in and, is hybrid. And I can speak on the hybrid too. There are, the Independent Book Publishers Association has put out criteria for hybrid publishing. And to really, in their eyes, to be le legitimate in regards to hybrid, you really need to have some criteria in place. Um, and absolutely, nobody should force you to buy, um, you know, a certain level of books or, or those types of things. I mean, it's always nice to have opportunity and options with it comes to marketing and, and partnership, but um, that's why I think today in general, um, I keep hearing a, a kind of a theme line through everything as do your research. I mean, this is your baby and you wanna make sure that you take your baby to somebody who's gonna support you in the way you need to be supported. Whether it's self-publishing, whether it's hybrid, whether it's traditional, this is your baby and you wanna have, there's so many opportunities out there to find something that is the right fit. Um, traditional may not be for you. <coughs> Self-publishing or hybrid may not be for you. It just needs to, you need to research what is the best avenue for you. And like like you said, ask the right questions um, and, and do a little research. What are, okay, if you're going to a hybrid, what are those criteria? What is the, you know, what do you need to know about that particular company? Because again, you don't want to be taken by anybody, let alone, you know, something that is maybe a little different or foreign to, to, to people. So. Make sure that when you are vetting the people that you want to work with, by the way, if you're not vetting the people you want to work with, you've already screwed up. I researched everyone that I'm sitting on this panel with before I came here today. I do that anytime I'm doing a presentation. So one of the things that I, and I've sat on panels with people I was like, I can't. And I've emailed, pre I've emailed people who are setting up panels that I can't be on panels with this person. They're dishonest in what they're putting forth. These guys are, are talking very plainly and honestly about what a hybrid press is, and they're being very upfront, talking very, serious, very honestly about the services that they're providing and that these services have a cost. There are people out there who will tell you that we are a traditional press and we want you to pay $5,000 in creation of your book. That's not what a traditional publisher does. So understand what the different forms of publishing are and understand what you should expect. And these are not things that you're going to learn from a publisher's website. Go on the absolute right water cooler forums. 
go on writer beware look on predators and editors all of these are free online resources where you can learn what the industry standards are for the different types of publishing i have a friend who's got who's published two books with a vanity press and he is perfectly happy and i i tell him every time i see him said baby why 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 you be doing this why you hurt my soul cedric and he's like i don't care i wrote two books of poetry and they published them and they have the rights to this book for seven years each and i get 10 percent of ebook sales and i get 20 percent off paperback prices and i'm like said it baby i would have just laid it out for you for 25 bucks and a case of beer you're my boy <laughs> i i like really good beer <laughs> but do your research and do it independent of those of us who are trying to make money from you because don't get me wrong a traditional publisher does intend to make money from your words we just plan to do it on the back end and hybrid publishers do too they're just having you offset the cost up front vanity presses plan to make money off of you every step of the way and you get very very tiny bits of it I have opinions. We know. <laughs> Betsy, can you, can you share what made you want to jump into freelancing after being in the traditional publishing industry for, for, for a while? What, what made you make that jump? Well, it was really kind of the work-life balance and, and um, you know, wanting to be with my kids. So, um, so that's why I went freelance. I was living in Connecticut at the time, commuting into New York City. And I couldn't, it was after 9-11, and I was just too nervous about commuting into the city and then being 50 miles away from my kids and not being able to get back to them. So I realized that I could go freelance, and, um, you know, I love traditional publishing. It's a very, um, it's an amazing world, and, and it really hasn't been um, captured, I don't think, in too many books or um, movies or television shows. But to be in an editorial meeting and discussing um, what you should publish and what you should not publish, is, is, there's nothing more fun. I mean, to me, it's like having people pitch the books that they're interested in and um, you know, talking about it and then say, well, their book, you know, three books ago didn't sell you know, past 2,000 copies. And so, you know, but this is different. And then people argue for the books that they want. It's really exciting to see a bunch of cover designs. It's really exciting. So me now, I'm working on my own, but the difference is I'm working with authors um, directly in the kind of the earlier stages, whereas before they were vetted through literary agents and they came completely polished and gorgeous to me. Now they're coming in not as beautiful, you know, a little, a little um, green, and that's a, a, an opportunity for me to to really help people. So whereas before I was kind of doing a little bit of editing and because once they reached me, they have already been pretty much vetted and gorgeous. Um, but now I'm doing a ton of editing and advising and holding authors' hands and, and making sure that I advise them on the process and what to expect and who agents are and, and what self-publishing is like. And, so it's it's a different process, but you know I, I highly recommend both. I just miss a little bit of the um, you know the the um, colleagues that I had. So now I make sure I get out you know two or three times a week and have lunch with people and go to the gym and stuff like that because otherwise it's me editing all day long. <laughs> it gets lonely just you and the cat. Yeah, yeah. and I have a big rescue dog. So. Ah. Mindy, could you tell us a, a few of the things you've learned the past two years with Warren and, and what that's looked like for you? Sure. Um, but I guess what I like the most are, it's always evolving. Um, it's, it's my, again, part of my background is marketing, and so um, I was speaking uh, with somebody earlier, and we were just talking about um, Marketing is so much a part of this process, regardless of, of where you publish, whether you're with a traditional, whether, and especially now, whether you're with hybrid or self-publish. Or um, marketing is like ninety, I would say ninety percent of, of really the, the getting a book put together. So um, 
what I have learned is, is you know, you, your job never ends, and it's always it's always putting on different hats and um, kind of that marketing end and the psychology of how and why people buy and, and where to reach out for each of the genres of books we do, where to kind of reach out um, on that hind end. After you put out a book, there's always that extra um, steps that are involved. So that's kind of something for me that I enjoy doing and that I like to do. And of course, like you said, it's getting out and meeting the authors and speaking with them and having, um, we, we work on trying to put a family together, really, uh, that supports, because we are a partnership with our authors, that's part of what I've always enjoyed doing too is that, you know, we try to build a family feeling where our authors can talk to each other and, hey, I'm doing this marketing thing, or, oh, hey, I heard about this thing over here, and so our Facebook is really important because they do some communication that way. We do, like, something called Wednesdays with Warren where we took a little hiatus off the summer because uh, our my sidekick just got back from maternity leave, so, you know, kind of recouping on that end, but um, it's where we have authors and they kind of talk to each other and work together to share ideas too. So that's something that for me has been important in the company that we do as a partner to truly listen to some great great angles and ideas that our authors have on what they're doing and what we can do to support them and vice versa. Thanks. John, you've had the whole gamut of experience <laughs> from being a self-published author now open it up to press. I've never published with the New York, but I've hit up, but I've hit the other stops. Yeah. yeah. So, so tell us just what you've learned along the way. Oh, good God! That's usually a question that involves alcohol. I know. <laughs> That's um, an after party. So, <laughs> there's a lot. The first thing is that you don't know enough when you start. I didn't know nearly enough to self-publish my first book when I self-published my first book. That's why I think it's on cover number four and layout number three, because I had I went to a convention and handed my book to a guy who ran a small press, and he opened it up and said, "This doesn't look like a book. This looks like a blog." Well, I'd spent the last five years writing 500 articles for internet poker blogs and websites, so yeah, I formatted it like a blog. I came back and opened a book on my shelf and said, "Wow, I'm an idiot." This, it's right here on the shelf. It shows me how to lay out a book, because here's a book. There's so much. It's all going to cost more than you expect. It's going to be harder than you expect. And the first time you get an email from a fan who says, you're my new favorite author, it's the best feeling you've ever had. Unless you have kids, I assume that may be better. <laughs> I don't know, I don't have kids, and I probably wouldn't like yours. <laughs> Unless they're sauteed with a nice mushroom sauce. <laughs> Make wrong too. <laughs> so, there's a ton, and it is always changing. Every time you think you've got it figured out, something's different. When I started, audiobooks were a little piece of the market. Now it's something I try to do with every title we release. When I started, I couldn't afford to make hardcovers, and now we do hardcovers with every novel length release. Not because they make us a whole lot of money, but because it does set us apart from a lot of small presses. And they look really nice. So libraries like them. Libraries, libraries do like them. I like them. I try to buy hardcovers when I a perfect segue uh, to you, Emily, from, from can you just kind of highlight some of the stuff that's rolling out from Biblioboard I mean, that's, that's available now through Charlotte Mecklenburg Library? Definitely, as kind of a quick segue here. Yeah. Um, through Charlotte Mecklenburg and through libraries, like I said, all across the U.S. and Canada, um, including some states where the entire state has all of these services, especially for those of you who are just starting out, um, it's just an easy way to expand your readership gain new audiences, and since it's all through the local library, it's all, it's probably the only thing you'll do in self-publishing that is truly free to you. It's all available through the library. We have a service called Pressbooks, which allows you to go in, upload your Word document, or write directly into your account there. Um, if you're doing NaNoWriMo, for example, you can actually start writing your whole book. And they have a whole selection of pre-made themes, one click of a button, automatically design your book. This will not give you of course, the same, the same level of quality as though you're going through 
a top five publisher or something like that, but it will get you a book that is looks like a book, is <laughs> very readable, um, and you can export as many different books as you'd like in as many different file formats, movie files, print ready PDFs, EPUBs, um, and then submit them directly through our indie distribution program that we do with Library Journal, where in each state and all, as well as our provinces for our Canadian libraries, we take all of the submissions from authors in that area and make them available on the Board Library as ebooks to anyone in that area. So we have that kind of in inclusive layer, but then of course at the same time, no one really wants to be inundating libraries or readers with maybe some less than quality titles or titles that might not circulate. Um, we do have a more kind of exclusive side where we partner with Library Journal and they go through the thousands and thousands of selfie, or selfie is the distribution program we're calling it right now. They go through all those submissions and they're selecting the best of the best out of those submissions from authors all over the world. And those are in our kind of curated, hand-picked library journal collections that are available at all of our participating libraries all across the US and Canada. So potentially a really huge increase in new readers. And also you then have the ability to go, when you're marketing your book, turn around and say, this globally known review entity in the library journal has picked my book as being a really standout, high quality indie read. And with that, we do a ton of promotion for our authors. So again, no cost to the author. We do write-ups on Library Journal's website. Um, we're partnering, partnering with Publishers Weekly a lot recently, um, doing podcasts, a variety, trying to really cover kind of all of our bases there to make sure that these indie voices are not just being published and kind of put out into oblivion there, but are actually being heard and promoted that way. Um, so it's also something that you have available now through the library. Um, and if you're looking for more information on that, I have a bunch of free tote bags and t-shirts and actual details on the program right back there in the corner. I'd be happy to talk about that as well. You, you will need a library card. <laughs> That's free, so it's no big deal. Um, thank you guys so much for the time. Um, we're about to do questions, but, but like our last panel, just one sentence or phrase you'd like to give the people out here. Keep your sense of humor. Mm -hmm. um, aim for as high quality as you can possibly get because you don't want to be embarrassed. Stay persistent. I think it was echoed in the initial panel up here. You would be startled to know how many rejection letters some of your probably best selling authors received before they became those best selling authors. Take your time and do your research. I feel like that's, don't rush anything. Can we thank our panel real quick? If you're uh, interested in, in submitting to um, traditional publishers with nonfiction books, um, you write a proposal instead of submitting a um, complete manuscript as you would for fiction. So it's table of contents, outline, author bio, marketing information, and two sample chapters. So it's in a way a lot easier process because you're um, not having to go through all the hoops of writing a complete polished um, manuscript. But on the other hand, then you have to do with uh, something called platform, um, which, so if you're writing a parenting book, they want to make sure that you are nationally recognized. You're on the Today Show, you have a column in a USA Today, or you know, something like that. So that's what you're up against in the nonfiction world. Um, you're competing against um, national experts in each of those genres. Okay. Great question. Go ahead. I'm wondering if any of you have advice for someone writing a movie or a play. <laughs> Read Save the Cat. It and that book also translates to writing genre fiction novels. It, it's a it's an amazing book. It's a great book. Yeah. And there's and someone has adapted the formula to save the cat for novels or something like that, but the original Save the Cat is a really good book, and you can absolutely adapt that format to writing novels because uh, I've done it. The North Carolina Writers Network is actually um, having a couple of um, sessions on screenwriting, and um, so and that's in, in three in, weeks in, in Charlotte. Three weeks in Charlotte. Um, 
So I definitely would recommend that to you. And there's also specialized software for writing um, screenplays, which is extremely important to yeah. use. We've also got a free program at University City Branch uh, next next Saturday, so a week from today, uh, for, for screenwriting. And that's a prototype program that I paid for, so please come. <laughs> <laughs> Yes. Uh, this question is more for Vinny. We wrote a children's book, and as we self-published it with Create Space, we had these gorgeous hand-on watercolors that bled first. So, with some of like the quality was lost. So, when we self-publish, pay for really high quality, and are now looking to make the jump towards a more traditional publisher. Can you speak to that jump for a self-published author to maybe getting picked up by a more traditional publisher? And do you need to have an agent in that process? How that works? I can kind of speak for some of it. I mean, yeah. uh, Betsy may be better yeah. when it comes to traditional okay. um, end of things, because our traditional imprint does not publish children's books. Okay. Um, partially just for the cost, because right. there is um, a little, there's more cost, quite frankly, in children's books than there is to produce um, uh, you know, nonfiction fiction. Right. Um, yeah, I think that the one thing to keep in mind um, is, Watercolors are great. I mean, I love them. And no matter what your medium is, it does need to be transferable to paper in the end to, to try to have that beautiful um, book. So I think that the one thing is kind of figuring out paper and, mm -hmm. and what paper your printers are using and or your um, traditional and or uh, hybrid. What kind of papers do they produce their book on? Because again, cost, if you produce on the highest quality paper you can do, it's beautiful, but it also is so expensive to produce, you would have to price point your book so high that it can't right. compete in that market. So, um, I don't know, Betsy, do you have any um, As far as a agents are concerned and transitioning, um, they love author illustrators, is, is what I've been told. And um, so, but if you're writing a straight, children's book and you're just the author of a children's book, um, do not associate yourself with an illustrator because the um, publisher wants to pick the illustrator for your book. So um, so that's kind of the difference. And you know, having a sales and a marketing plan in place of, of how well you've done with the first book perhaps. But there are other venues for getting really high quality paper um, I've had some um, authors print in Korea um, and, and importing the books because the, the cost of printing the paper is a lot lower and then you import, but that means you can't do print on demand. Right. That means you have to print your own books. But So it's, um, it's a hard sell to get with literary agents, but um, you know, do your research and make sure mm -hmm. that you follow the submissions guidelines. Yeah, thank you. Mm -hmm. Two questions. Is that okay? We'll let you do it. I'm okay. just kidding, Mr. Jay. Yes, go ahead. Oh, thank you. Um, Betsy, you mentioned about ghostwriting, and the thing is, how do you get used to, like, able to properly mimic the main writer's voice in a way so no one can know your writing voice? Um, you spend a lot of time with your um, client and make sure that. You know, you can record it and make sure that you get their cadence down right in their voice, and then hopefully they edit you right back. Um, so I had a, I worked with an NFL um, football player, and he would say, "Betsy, that is something I would never say." Um, you know, that you sound like a girl, like a girl right here, and I'm like, "Well, yeah, I don't have that." Experience. So he would edit me right back and sit down with me. So that back and forth relationship is very um, important for ghostwriting. And the second question is, thank you. And the second question is to John, um, what were the other vetting sites? Because I got the Absolute Water Cooler and Predator and Editors. Writer Beware. Okay. And Absolute Write is the main website and the Water Cooler are their forums. Well, you, can, you can Google somebody and see whether they come up on one of these yeah. websites. Yeah. I did not know all of them. <laughs> I do a lot of appearances and I want to know who I'm sitting with. Who else? Anybody else? Yeah. I, can I touch back on the children's book thing? You said um, 
not to associate with an illustrator, which is, makes perfect sense. Now, with that being said, if you have an idea for what may be the cover, is that a good idea or a bad idea? Because I know if you're going to go with a you know, traditional publisher, they might have more knowledge of the area, right? Yeah, and um, that goes into a contract situation. So if you end up signing a contract with a, with a traditional publisher, they will never give you the right to, um, to yes or no uh, a, a, a jacket. You can get a consult, which is always a good thing to get, and they will not necessarily give that to you right away, so that's something to negotiate. But no, I mean, you could say in your submissions letter, you could say, I, um, you know, I like, I'm inspired by so and such and such and such, which might put an image in their brain about what you're going for as far as the illustrations or the look of your book, and that you would like. Know, it to be similar to that sort of book, but yeah, I would just leave it plain and just have the editor think in her brain, what is this gonna, who would this match best with? Because they have a huge um, amount of people that they work with. Okay, I wanna be cognizant of time. Can we give our, our panel another? Thank you guys so much, really appreciate it. Thank you to all of our panelists, they're awesome.